In a word, awesome. The guy was the greatest I've ever been around. Probably the most talented guy I've ever seen in my life. He was the greatest defensive player to ever play. Best one ever put on the pad. Taylor now. I'm not putting anybody in Lawrence Taylor's class, so you can put everybody down below that. that. That's with a lot of respect to a lot of good players now, but we're talking about Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence Julius Taylor was born on the 4th of February, 1959. He was the oldest of three sons born to Clarence and Iris Taylor in Williamsburg, Virginia. His father worked as a dispatcher at the Newport News shipyards, while his mother was a schoolteacher. Referred to as Lonnie by his family, Lawrence was a mischievous youth. His mother said that he was challenging as a child. Where the other two boys would ask for permission to do things, Lonnie would just do it. Taylor concentrated on baseball as a youth, in which he played the position of catcher. He only began playing football at the advanced age of 15, and did not begin playing organized football until his junior year in high school. As a result, Lawrence was not heavily recruited coming out of high school, and after graduating from Lafayette in 1977, Lawrence attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he became a team captain. Lawrence, wearing number 98, was originally recruited as a defensive lineman, playing nose guard. However, Taylor would soon be switched to linebacker before the 1979 season. He had 16 sacks in his final year there in 1980 and set numerous defensive records. He was recognized as a consensus first team All-American and the ACC Player of the Year in 1980. While at UNC, the coaching staff marveled at his intense, reckless style of play. As a freshman playing on special teams, he'd jump a good six or seven feet in the air, block a punt, then land on the back of his neck, said North Carolina assistant coach Bobby Kale. He was reckless, just reckless. He finished his college career with 21 career sacks, 33 tackles for loss, 192 career tackles, and one interception. UNC would later go on to retire with Lawrence Taylor's jersey. Before the 1981 NFL Draft, a poll was given out to NFL general managers asking who they would select if they had the first overall pick. 26 of the league's 28 GMs said they would take Taylor. One of the two GMs who disagreed was Bum Phillips, who had just been hired as the head coach and general manager of the New Orleans Saints. This was a big deal because come draft day, the New Orleans Saints, who had the first pick in the draft, would not take Lawrence Taylor. Instead, the Saints selected running back George Rogers, who had just won the Heisman Trophy at the University of South Carolina. To the roar of the crowd in New York City, the Giants selected Lawrence Taylor with the second pick in the 1981 NFL Draft. One of the factors that the Giants said they considered in selecting Taylor was his solid reputation. He was the cleanest player in the draft. By that I mean there was no rap on him, said head coach Ray Perkins. Great potential as a linebacker, a fine young man, free of injuries. Lawrence would later explain to Sports Illustrated in 2010 that he did not remember a single thing about draft night because he had drank 41 Coors Lights. Taylor chose to wear number 56 because he was a fan of Cowboys linebacker Thomas Henderson. Taylor exploded onto the scene in the NFL having one of the greatest rookie seasons ever seen. He had 9.5 sacks, one forced fumble, one recovered, 
and one interception. He was named Defensive Rookie of the Year and Defensive Player of the entire league. The only rookie to ever be named Defensive Player of the Year. Lawrence Taylor's rookie season was so good that his teammates started calling him Superman. However, in contrast to his on-field success, Taylor was already developing a reputation for his recklessness off the field. After LT was nearly killed in a car crash, GM George Young told the team's trainer that he would be surprised if LT lived past the age of 30. The Giants therefore decided to take out a $2 million life insurance policy for Lawrence Taylor. In addition to several automotive incidents, Lawrence would eventually reveal in his 2004 autobiography, LT Over the Edge, that at this point in his career, very early on, he began trying cocaine, first at a house party. This began a period of drug abuse for LT, which he claims elevated from cocaine to crack cocaine by his third season. In his second season in 1982, Lawrence Taylor would record one of the greatest plays in his career when he had a 97-yard pick six against Gary Danielson and the Lions to seal the game. This is known as the game that Lawrence Taylor beat a team by himself. He finished the game with a sack, a forced fumble, and the 97-yard pick six. What's more extraordinary, though, is that he did this all in one half as he had missed the entire first half of the game due to a bothersome knee injury. Lawrence Taylor would be named Defensive Player of the Year for the second time in his second professional season. However, the Giants, in a strike-shortened season, would finish just 4-5. and five. Over the next three years, Parcells and Taylor would help transform the Giants into perennial playoff contenders, with Lawrence Taylor being named first-team All-Pro each and every year. The New York Giants selected Carl Banks with third overall selection in the 1984 NFL Draft, forming what was known as the Big Blue Wrecking Crew, along with Harry Carson and Lawrence Taylor. Taylor would have one of his best career games in the 1984 season with four sacks coming against the Buccaneers in Week 4. In 1985, Taylor was responsible for one of the most gruesome injuries the NFL has ever seen when he collided with Washington quarterback Joe Theismann for a sack. This left Theismann with a broken leg and while he was being carted off the field he said to Taylor, I'll be back. With Lawrence responding, yes, but not tonight Joe. Theismann was wrong. He would not be back. The compound fracture of Joe Theismann's tibia and fibula led to insufficient bone growth during his recovery, leaving his right leg shorter than his left. As a result, the injury ended Theismann's career, forcing him to retire at the end of the season, aged 36. Despite Taylor apologizing countless times, Joe Theismann has never blamed Lawrence for the injury, simply saying he was just doing his job. In 1986, Taylor led the league with 20 and a half sacks, four of them coming against the Eagles in week six. LT guided the Giants to victory over the Denver Broncos in Super Bowl XXI later on that season, and was named MVP of the entire league, just the second defensive player in league history to receive that honor. The following season the Giants struggled, finishing 6-9 and nine and 5th in the NFC East in the infamous strike-shortened 87 season. They hoped to rebound to their championship ways in 1988, but the start of the season was marred by controversy surrounding Taylor. He tested positive for cocaine and was suspended by the league for 30 days as it was his second violation of the NFL's substance abuse policy. The first result in the prior season had been kept private and was not known to the public at the time. He was kept away from the press during this period and checked himself into rehab in early September. The Giants would go 2-2, two in the games that Taylor missed. When he returned, he was his usual dominant self and led the team in sacks again with 15 and a half in just 12 games. The 1988 season also contained some of the more memorable moments of Taylor's career. In a crucial late season game with playoff implications against the New Orleans Saints, Taylor played through a torn pectoral muscle to record seven tackles, 
three sacks, and two forced fumbles. In 1989, Taylor recorded 15 sacks. He was forced to play the latter portion of the season with a fractured tibia, suffered in a 34-24 loss to the 49ers in Week 12, which caused him to sit out the second half of several games. Despite his off-the-field problems, Taylor remained popular among his teammates and was voted defensive co-captain, along with linebacker Carl Banks. Together the two filled the defensive captain's vacant spot, left by the retired Harry Carson. Lawrence would hold out of training camp just before the 1990 season, demanding a new contract with a salary of $2 million per year. With talks dragging into September and neither side budging, the season approached and Taylor received fines at a rate of $2,500 a day. He received a three-year $5 million contract, making him the highest paid defensive player in the league just four days before the preseason opener. Despite sitting out the entire training camp, Taylor would record three sacks and a forced fumble in the preseason game against the Eagles. The Giants started out 10-0 and finished with a 13-3 record. In the playoffs, the Giants defeated the Bears 31-3 and faced the rival 49ers in the NFC Championship game, where they would win 15-13 after Taylor beat two successive blocks by 49ers tight end Brent Jones and fullback Tom Ratham to recover a forced fumble by nose tackle Eric Howard which set up Matt Barr's game-winning field goal. In Super Bowl 25, they played the Buffalo Bills and defeated them 20-19 after Buffalo's kicker Scott Norwood missed a potential game-winning field goal in the closing seconds of the game. In 1991, there was a visible decline in Taylor's production. It became the first season in his career in which he failed to make the Pro Bowl. He had made it his first 10 seasons in the league just the second player to do so, after Merlin Olsen. Taylor rebounded in the early stages of what many thought would be his final season in 1992. Through almost nine games, Taylor was on pace for ten sacks and the Giants were five and four. However, a ruptured Achilles tendon suffered in a game on November 8, 1992 against Green Bay sidelined him for the final seven games, during which the team went one and six. Before the injury, Taylor had missed only four games due to injury, in his 12-year career. Taylor returned for the 1993 season enticed by the chance to play with a new coach, Dan Reeves. Also determined not to end his career due to injury, the Giants would end up having a resurgent season in 1993. They finished 11-5 and competed for the top NFC playoff seed, with Taylor finishing with six sacks and the Giants defense leading the NFL in fewest points allowed. They defeated the Minnesota Vikings 17-10 in the opening round of the playoffs. The next week, on January 15, 1994, in what would be Taylor's final game, the Giants were beaten 44-3 by the 49ers. As the game came to a conclusion, television cameras drew in close on Taylor. He announced his retirement at the post-game press conference saying, I think it's time for me to retire. I've done everything I can do. I've been to Super Bowls, I've been to playoffs, I've done things that other people haven't been able to do in this game before. After 13 years, it's time for me to go. In his 13 year NFL career, Lawrence Taylor tallied 1,089 tackles, 140 sacks, 9 interceptions, 2 touchdowns, 33 forced fumbles, and 11 recoveries. To date, he is the only rookie to ever win Defensive Player of the Year, the only player to ever win Defensive Player of the Year for their first two seasons, just one of two players to ever win the MVP as a Defensive Player. He's one of three players to ever win Defensive Player of the Year three times. He's one of three players to start their career with ten straight Pro Bowls, the others being Merlin Olsen and Joe Thomas. His legacy as one of the greatest football players was cemented in 1999 when he was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame as a first ballot selection. Lawrence Taylor changed the game in many ways, but one in particular 
was when Washington Redskins head coach Joe Gibbs developed the two tight end offense in the position of the halfback. All in order to prevent Lawrence Taylor from getting to the quarterback. Coach Gibbs said that we had to try in some way to have a special game plan just for Lawrence Taylor. Now he didn't do that very often in this league, but I think he's one person that made us learn our lesson the hard way. We lost games. After his retirement, Lawrence Taylor would work as a football analyst for the now defunct TNT Sunday Night Football. In a one-off show, Taylor also appeared as a wrestler in the World Wrestling Federation, defeating Bam Bam Bigelow in the main event of WrestleMania 11. Taylor also worked as a color commentator on an amateur fighting program entitled Tough Man on the FX channel. On September 4, 1995, Lawrence would help the Giants retire quarterback Phil Simms' jersey during halftime of a game against the Cowboys. Taylor also had his trouble with the law. Between 1996 and 1998, he was arrested three times on drug charges. After completing a rehab program in 1998, he pursued a career in acting, appearing in films including The Waterboy with Adam Sandler, Any Given Sunday with Al Pacino, and The Sopranos with James Gandolfini. Taylor also voiced the character of B.J. Smith in Grand Theft Auto Vice City, released in 2002. In 2009, LT started having more troubles in his personal life. On November 8th, he was arrested in Miami-Dade County, Florida, for leaving the scene of an accident after striking another vehicle. He had committed the same offense in 1996 when he totaled his Lexus in a one-car accident and left the scene. His excuse? He did not think that the law was required in the reporting of a single driver incident. He was released on a $500 bond. In May 2010, Taylor was arrested and charged with third-degree rape and solicitation of a prostitute after he had allegedly paid $300 to a 16-year-old girl at a hotel in Suffern, New York. In January 2011, he pleaded guilty to sexual misconduct and patronizing a prostitute, both misdemeanor charges, and was sentenced to six years of probation. In June 2017, Lawrence pleaded guilty to driving under the influence of alcohol following a September 2, 2016 crash into a stopped police car in Palm Beach County, Florida. Breathalyzer tests taken several hours after the crash measured Taylor's blood alcohol level to be 0 .082 and 0 .084, both above the Florida legal limit of 0 .08. LT would receive two felony charges on December 20th of 2021 for failing to alert authorities to a change in address as a registered sex offender. He pleaded not guilty in March of 2022. Taylor has seven children and is married three times. In his autobiography in 2004, Lawrence Taylor described LT as an adrenaline junkie who lived life on a thrill ride. Taylor said in 2003 that LT died a long time ago, and I don't miss him at all. All that's left is Lawrence Taylor. Today, Lawrence spends most of his time with his loved ones and enjoys traveling and playing golf. I look back and think scoring touchdowns and coming off the field, it was always Lawrence. The first guy there. You know, I'm still looking for that next Lawrence Taylor. I haven't seen that guy. Without you guys, there wouldn't have been a Lawrence Taylor. But there wouldn't have been an LT. Thank you very much.